right now, and uh, Venerable Ajahn Mahabhuva is a, uh, a disciple of Ajahn Man and is one of the sort of remaining uh, disciples who is still alive, because Ajahn Man was was the kind of the grandfather of the resurrecting, re- reinvigorating the forest tradition in Thailand. And uh, Ajahn Mahabhua has, has uh, continued in that tradition and has trained many, many uh, teachers, uh, both uh, monastics and, of course, has a very large following of lay people. Uh, so this evening, uh, we invited Ajahn Dik to uh, just if share some of his uh, experiences with training uh, with uh, Ajahn Mahabhua. Uh, say Ajahn Dik himself has been a monk now for 30 years and uh, has had a lot of experience. So that uh, would be a great opportunity for us to be able to hear some of that experience and just for him to uh, give an informal talk and share some of his experience with us and then also if any uh, anybody has any questions I'm sure that he'd be happy to to uh, uh, answer those so please <laughs> So I guess one of the many things that I learned from Ajahn Mahabua, who, who now everyone calls Lung Ta, he's, he's, no one calls him Ajahn Mahabua anymore. They, now they all call him Lung Ta, which is, really means Venerable Grandfather. He's sort of the last in that line, the direct descendants, the direct disciples of Ajahn Man. But one of the many things he taught was the importance of having a really good teacher. And I didn't actually start out with him. I started out in India with Buddha Rakita Tara. And in, in those days, we kind of stumbled into Buddhism, or at least Theravada Buddhism. And we, we, there was no place to really search for it, and we, we were searching until we sort of stumbled into it, or, or some twist of fate brought us to a place where we could practice it. And it's a long story how I got there. But several twists of good karma brought me to uh, uh, Buddha Rakita Tara in Bangalore. And so he was really my first teacher. And he was my first experience with, with a teacher. And he accepted me there and put me in doing intensive meditation sitting that one hour, walking one hour, sitting one hour, doing Anapanasati more or less in the, the Burmese tradition. He'd been trained in Burmese style. And I did that and really put a lot of effort into it. And when I did that, I would go into very calm, quiet, still state for a while, which felt really, really good, really like coming home. And I'd go and I'd explain this to him. And he'd say, no, 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 no. you don't want that. <laughs> you stay away from that. that that's, not the, that's not the practice I'm teaching you here. You, know, so you keep moving, you keep scanning, you keep doing. But don't, don't go still like that. that, that this is dead end. <laughs> stay away from that. So I went back and tried really hard to stay away from that, but in the end it would keep coming back to the same place, into that really calm. But, and I knew it was right, it was good. No matter what he said, and I, I, you know, I kept going back to him for a while and ex- trying to explain to him until I could see that he wasn't going to budge. And I thought, well, I'll just keep it to myself now. I'll keep practicing it and keep, <laughs> keep it myself. But it, I began to see then that you know, the, the, the teachers were important. The teachers being able to, to tailor the teaching to the individual and not just make a teaching for everyone and expect everyone to follow the teacher's teaching. Maybe the teacher got good results by following that teaching, but everyone's different. Everyone's an individual, a lot of different characters, and not everyone's going to suit that one practice. So the teacher has to actually be able to see through 
the student and know what's good for that student and be able to listen and accept, too. So I, I found he was a bit sort of now and rigid in that way, but he was very good. I mean, I liked him a lot. We got along well, but I, I kept part of my practice then to myself for a long time. <laughs> And eventually I, I left. I actually ordained there as a salmonera with him. And then I left and went to Sri Lanka after, after about nine months. And that's another long story. But when I got to Sri Lanka, then, then I was, what got into a situation. He put me into a situation with Narada Tara, who was a very, very famous uh, scholar, monk in, in Sri Lanka. And he set me up, helped set me up in a... In a Watt there, where I started trying to pick up meditation again. It was it was a study watt. Mostly it was most of the monks in, in, that I met in Sri Lanka were doing quite a lot of studying, but they allowed me to practice and they gave me a small kuti on the property where I could practice. So I got back into it, and I found that when I had questions coming up and I went to the teachers their main response was to say, well, check on Bhisudi on page 152, your answer is there. <laughs> or something similar. I mean, they would refer to the text. Then the Buddha teaches this and the Buddha teaches that. But they didn't seem to have their own personal experience that they could fall back on and say, I understand what you're talking about. And, and I've been through that and I can, I can guide you. So I became a little discouraged with that. I stayed in Sri Lanka f- with it, at that Wat for probably a year, and then I went off to do meditation in Kandy and, and uh, with Nyanaponika. I went to see Nyanaponika there, and Bhikkhu Bodhi was staying there, and I'd known Bhikkhu Bodhi in India. We were together there, actually, for the Pansa in, in, in Purvakitas. He taught me Pali, actually, for, for the whole Pansa. <laughs> anyway, that's off the point. Uh, he, he, he was there, and uh, I was there for a while. Again, it's very scholarly atmosphere at the Forest Hermitage and the surrounding. So I was going to go off to some caves, monastery, and I went to say goodbye to Bhikkhu Bodhi. It is Kuri. I went to look for him at Kuri, and he wasn't there. So I went in, and there was a bookshelf there, and I was just looking at the books, waiting for him to come back. And and I always was looking for books that I hadn't seen before. And there was one there that I hadn't seen called Forest Dhamma. And I pulled it out and looked at it, and this is by Achan Mahabua, translated by Achan Panya, Achan Panya Wato. And the title interested me right away, Forest Dhamma. And I started thumbing through it, and my, it was a ride coming to pick me up, and I knew I didn't have much time. And I said, well, that's really, I'm going to have to remember this book. And when I see Bhikkhu Bodhi, I'm going to ask him about it. So he was waiting for the car there. So I asked him about it, and he said, oh, you can get them at the BPS, where they sent a lot of them from Thailand. And I, but I was going the opposite direction from, from the downtown Candy, and finally he said, well, just take my copy. I'll get another one myself. So he gave me his copy. Very nice. And I took that to the cave, and by the time I finished reading it, I knew where I wanted to go. <laughs> okay. I mean, it wasn't so much any particular thing that was said there, but it was the whole tone of the book and the whole tenor and everything of the, of the way he talked about it and the way he talked about the wisdom practice. One of the problems in Sri Lanka was that most bhikkhus believe that you could no longer attain the ultimate goal that we were you know, ordained to attain, that it was beyond us. I mean, it was the, the age had passed. I mean, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it was no longer, we were no longer capable of it. And the best we could do was just study and, and learn and make a lot of good karma. But, you know, somehow the path had been blocked. And even the, the best monks I met there were, were saying that. I mean, there was one German monk yeah. Jana Wimala. But anyway, he was I was very impressed with him. And he, he he said he walked all over the island looking for somebody who could teach him the way of Panya, of wisdom, 
And he said, I can assure you there's no one here that can do that. I've gone everywhere. Every time there was a clue, and he used to walk everywhere. He never, he never accepted a ride. And he walked everywhere. So the best you can do is just, if you have a problem, go to one of the best scholars in the country and ask him for advice and accept that. So that was a little discouraging <laughs> already. And, and then, you know, my experience was the same. So when I, when I read this, I, the, the whole feeling was, yeah, there's a way. And, and somebody knows the way. And he's in Thailand. He's not here in Sri Lanka. So that's where I should be. So, I mean, the people were a little upset. That my Pajaya was a little upset. Some of the other monks were not very. But, and they openly said, you know, you're foolish to think that you can go to Thailand and find anything that you can't find here. It's just like you're dreaming. Yeah, so. And a matter of fact, Jana Wimala told me that when he, he came and scolded me harshly. <laughs> One, one evening, just before I was going to leave, and I ended up you know, walking Chonkong most of the night trying to decide, you know, what, I had a lot of respect for him. I mm-hmm. he was very good. Whether he was right or I was right, my, my gut feeling was, you know, I should go, and in the end, I, I knew I was the thing I had to do. So I did. And came and, and arrived in Thailand, and I actually traveled with Kanti Palo, who was uh, there doing some scholarly work. And we went to Wat Bawan, and he helped me to get reordained. There, I had to take another ordination in Thailand. And while I was there, I met a lot of Achan Pasano's contemporaries who were, and, and, and Joseph's contemporaries who were down there. It was, it was a kind of center in Bangkok for, for Western monks of the coming time, whether they came from Achan Chan's tradition or Achan Mahabua's or where. A lot of them staying there. And I came in and said, I want to go to see, stay with Ashan Mahapua. Oh, you know, he's, he's pretty rough. You know, he's very strict and he's very fierce. And he, better think, think about that again. <clears throat> and I, I, mean, I said, I read the book and you know, it really impressed me. And I, I said, well, you know, you should shop around a bit. <laughs> you know, a lot of good teachers <laughs> don't just rush off to the, to the, the first one you, you, know, you read a book about. There are a lot of good teachers here. <laughs> you, you, you. So, I mean, I, I sort of observed them there. A lot of them had been shopping around, some of them for months, some of them for years. And I could see that you know, they were still shopping. They hadn't settled on <laughs> any of the teachers at all. So, but this... this <laughs> You know, I'd made up my mind and I said, you know, I'm going to do it. And then, uh, you know, I'll find out later whether it was the right decision. <laughs> so I did. I reordained there and got permission. I had to write. I wrote to Achan Panya and asked for permission to go up and stay there. And I, you know, received the answer, you're welcome to come and stay. And, and if, if we get along with you and you get along with us, then you can stay, you know, as long as that applies, in other words. So as long as you get along with us and we get along with you, then fine, you can stay as long as you like. So that's when I went up to, to Udon, from left Wapa Warren, went up. The day I arrived, there was a meeting. He, uh, Ajahn Mahabur used to call meetings at least once a week, in the evenings at about dusk. And they were spontaneous. He would just come walking out the, one day, and would, there's no schedule to it, whenever he felt like it. It could be every five days, it could be every seven days, or ten days, or something. But on average, once a week. And this is the time when he would, would teach the bhikkhus exclusively. And it just happened that when I arrived that evening, there was a meeting called. I had just got there and hadn't been there more than half an hour. So, and then there was a meeting call. So that, that was auspicious. I, everyone sort of thought, yeah, as you, soon as you arrive, there's a meeting. So we sat down. I couldn't understand what he was talking about in time. But the feeling was right. I just focused on my practice, and I got very calm and quiet, peaceful. And he actually, that's one of his teachings, is when you listen to somebody giving a Dhamma talk, you shouldn't pay too much attention to what he's saying and try to you know, follow along with every word and try to understand the teaching that he's giving, rather you should let the sound of that teaching come inside and resonate inside your heart. 
and you will pick up the things that are really important to you. you, you you'll hear them and, and pick them up. But it's important that the teaching resonates inside and just isn't in your head. So some people listen, and they try to listen very carefully and f- keep thinking and trying to figure out what he says and what he means. And he would always discourage that. He would say, just, just listen, let the sound come in, let the sound come in. Let the sound of Dhamma will resonate with the Dhamma inside the individual, and that will bring you to a really good, calm, quiet, peaceful state. And that's the whole purpose of his giving a talk, to get you to that state. And that understanding is worth more than, than the intellectual kind of understanding you may gain from. Thinking and thinking and thinking, and some people distract themselves, trying to worrying about whether they understood and could, did I remember everything he said? And that's another thing. It, it doesn't really matter whether you remember. He himself didn't remember what he, his talks were very spontaneous. <laughs> his talks were very spontaneous, and they, they came up. He would just go quiet for for a while, and then he would start talking. And often he himself would not remember afterwards what he had said. He would say that quite quite. <coughs> So this, this was one aspect I had to, to learn, but I, you can learn it more easily when, you're, when you don't understand the language because you, you don't have that to fall back on. So you just focus on your practice and let the sound of that go inside and carry you and carry the practice in, into a good place. So we all relied on that because these meetings would we'd come, as I say, once a week. And oftentimes you'd be doing your practice Intensifying your practice alone, because it, it, the what you know, everyone was in an individual hut, kuti, and separated by quite a lot of forest. So we were all practicing alone, practicing hard, and problems were coming up. And it, he wasn't available for interviews all the time. He, he that wasn't his style. He would give a talk every week, and you brought those problems with you. And somehow, in the course of his talk you find a way to solve those problems. He seemed to be able to touch on the, the, the aspect of your problem, which was the most severe, as it were, and, and give some insight in a mysterious way. I, and that's not, it's not that he, he said anything particular, but somehow by following his voice and following the, the whole talk, you suddenly got some clarity on things that you didn't have before. So it, was, it became a, you know, you look forward to that. They used to run around and yell. They didn't have a bell for some reason. He didn't like bells, I guess, but they, they, the monks would run around and, and just yell, pachum, 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 running through the forest. <laughs> but pachum means meeting. Just meeting. Meeting, meeting, the meeting, yeah. So every dusk, you know, if you knew it was almost a week and you'd be sitting doing practice at dusk and you'd be listening really closely to hear the first, you know, pachum call. Everyone rush down to, to the sound to do uh, sit and listen to the talk. So that that was an important part of the, uh, the practice. But I I got kind of lucky somehow. Maybe is it another twist of good karma or something? I don't know. But I used to in the morning before Pindapat, we would all stand in the sala, and he would come over because he would go with us in those days. And he would usually give an informal talk, just standing there with everyone waiting to go out for Pindapai. And one day, I mean, I, I used to just stand at the railing and close my eyes and, and just sort of feel calm and peaceful when he was talking. And I guess he saw that maybe I was a little too laid back or something, I don't know. But anyway, he sort of pointed me out one day and told, told me to go and start helping in his goodie, helping doing, doing the chores and doing the duties there. And so that opened up a whole new phase because I was pretty much by my, to myself then and doing my own practice. And it was, you know, emphasis, a lot of emphasis on calm and very little emphasis on doing the wisdom practice. He teaches wisdom. I mean, when you go and work with him, everything, you have to be very mindful of everything, very alert to everything. <clears throat> and that's, that was you know, mainly the way he would teach, is to test you with, with the, 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 the things that you were required to do for him. And everything, 
every time there was a change in circumstance, you had to know what to do in that circumstance. So <clears throat> he would, you know, he would, he would do things and you'd have to observe them because mm-hmm. he would have a reason for doing them. And if he changed it and did it another way, then there was obviously a reason why he did that and you had to figure it out because he wouldn't tell you. <laughs> but you had to work, try to work out by noticing the various different ways that he would do any one thing, why he did it in that way, in that particular, which meant <clears throat> being aware of all the other things that were going on around you at the same time, around him, to see why. Because he would expect you to know how to do it yourself if you had to do it under those circumstances, under the varying circumstances. And a lot of the way he would teach would be to keep you always mindful yeah. so that you couldn't memorize the way things should be done and just go do it every day by rote. If you, if you try that, you get the hammer. He used to call it that. <laughs> the hammer. And so you had to be very... And you had to try to think like he did. And the best thing to do was to try to think the way he thought. And that took some observation and everything. But he was, you know, particularly interested in, in what was going on in here. Mm-hmm. So what your intentions were, what your attitude was. And if it was, you know, the intentions were good and the attitude was good, you could get away with quite a lot. But if, if he felt that, that you know, you, you were doing things, uh, you know, doing it, I mean, it, it was like <clears throat> being dishonest. If he felt you were being dishonest, you knew that, that you should do it that way, but you were t- just lazy and you didn't. Mm-hmm. Or you were... You, you know, resentful of something or you're doing it out of spite or doing it for, for you know, wrong reasons, then he, he, would, he, he would jump on that immediately. So he would look in, in other words, he would see the defilements. If he saw defilements there, he would go after them immediately. If, if he felt that you were honestly trying to do the best you could and, and uh, with good intentions, then he, you know, he would accept that. And he would accept it if you thought you had a better way of doing it. Than he did, and he saw that it was you know it worked you know that was all right, and if you you know you're really trying hard and you he would encourage that, but he didn't like dishonesty in, in any form in in um, in his in his disciples, so that that was something you had to always be careful of because it's easy to sort of fall into that and just cut corners and do it, you know, think, ah, it doesn't really matter, does it? This way, do it this way, that way. <laughs> and then you find out it does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was, he, he's not the kind of person that you could get familiar with easily. Mm-hmm. He didn't, didn't uh, stand much familiarity, so it wasn't very friendly I mean, it was always strict he was he was, had a, you know a lot of metta he was you, know, you could feel that but he was always looking to teach you know the student in some way when they were there though he he was always and he would always tailor the teaching to to the individual so he'd never ask you to do more than you could do and he would never suggest that you do something that you know wasn't good for you wasn't proper so he would adjust always adjust his teaching and he could see right through people we all knew that even though he never said it, and he never even Im- implied that he had any sort of mind-reading ability or psychic powers or anything like that, which a lot of the, the uh, senior giants were well known for having that. And he, he would never mention them. He'd never talk about them, never claim And he would even imply that he really didn't have the, the sort of inherent tendencies of character for that kind of thing. He was a wisdom character, and these things didn't apply to him. But we all knew. (laughs) And and that was one thing that you you learned very quickly. He could see right through you. (laughs) So it it was, you know, very good experience to go through but he was. He was very strict. Strict, but, you know, fierce. I mean, he would, look, he would, he would lose his temper. You were sure that if, if you saw him, you know, saw him and didn't know him, you'd think he'd lost his temper. And he would really get fierce. And he would yell and yell and yell. And then 
you know, just sit down as if nothing happened. And it, was, it, was, it was kind of an act that he was putting on to, in order to teach people, in order to get their attention, I guess. And some people need you know, more than others. And some, some t- types of character he, he would just go after <laughs> continuously. Though he liked people who could, who would, who could think and, and, and reason and understand and then accept his reasoning and follow it and, and, and try to learn the way he thought and put it into practice in one, oneself and one's own you know, daily life and one's own meditation practice. But I was lucky because I also had Ajahn Panya there, who was a senior English one, whom I could talk to, you know, really long discussions. And he, he, had, he had that character too, wisdom character. So he was able to put things in many different perspectives. And that was very helpful. It took me a long time to learn Thai in order to, to pick up Lung Thais, Ajahn Mahabhu's. But Ajahn Pani was there right from the beginning. But Ajahn Mahabur always said that Farangs, the, the Westerners, were the most difficult to teach. He said they, they, there's bhikkhus anyway. The Western bhikkhus, he said, extremely difficult to teach. And he had to do it personally. He felt that he had to do it personally. <laughs> he, if he couldn't do it personally, then he, he didn't want to have a lot of Western people around. And there, there, there came a time after I'd been there seven or eight years, maybe, that he, he was, his health was not very good. And he then told Ajahn Pani, he said, I don't want to have any more Westerns. And it was a long drought there. We didn't have any. But he, 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 I mean, he took it you know, as a responsibility that he, that he would teach and that's why most of us who were working at his kuli were it was Ian and mm-hmm. was a couple of others were, were Westerners. Stubborn, I, you know, he found we were all Westerners. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, <no. laughs> Like Ajahn Chah used to call the the monastery where the Westerners were was called Wat Bung Wai, mm-hmm. and Ajahn Chah would often refer to it as Wat Wun Wai. <laughs> <laughs> Wun Wai means to just confuse the Ajahn. <laughs> <laughs> the monastery of confusion. <laughs> <laughs> But people were, were, I mean, he evoked fear in people. And that was one of the, when I first went there, everyone was afraid of him. Literally, people wouldn't go there. Mm-hmm. Lay people wouldn't go there. Monks wouldn't go there. <laughs> Terrifying. <of him. laughs> so they were a little surprised when I wanted to go, and they were trying to warn me, you know, you know this is no joke. He, this. But, uh, I mean, lots and lots of lay people. Would, just wouldn't set foot in the wild because he was, he was very fierce. And it worked well f- for, the, for the monastery because it made it very quiet. There, there weren't these crowds of people in it. And, and there weren't that many monks either. No. Once he's relaxed and he's gotten older now and relaxed, and it's different. Yeah, I'd heard his reputation. Of course, I was in, in Thailand at the time. heard his reputation and uh, after being at Ajahn Chah's for, I don't know, two, three years, for something like that, and I had the opportunity to go up to Banta mm-hmm. for a few years. I can't remember how long it was. It that, wasn't that many years. And, uh, and he, of course, he had this tremendous reputation of fierceness and, mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of fear. You know, people had a lot of fear. Mm-hmm. And... I know that, so I tried to make my mind as calm, as clear as possible, and mm-hmm. be there. And it was really interesting because what I experienced was a tremendous amount of loving kindness. Mm. Because that's his, it was, it, I mean, his temperament, I think, even from, in his own 
words of uh, you know, Ajahn Man used to give him a bad time of his sort of mm. his his kind of his temperament being mm. being like a boxer. Mm. Mm. Um, but uh, his temperament was one thing, but his his sort of presence and his in, intention was mm. always to really help people, mm. and I really felt it very very strongly. Mm. Uh, it was, it was very inspiring to, mm. to be around him. But yeah, to live with him. It would definitely you know, take But it had a very, very positive effect on, on meditation practice mm-hmm. and on everyone doing meditation practice mm-hmm. there. So, it's very powerful mm-hmm. vibration. Mm-hmm. And even now, I mean, it's still the same. People come there and they, they, they've never done meditation before, or they've, they have very little experience, and they come and they, they feel really comfortable there, <laughs> even though it's now very hectic and, and a lot more people. I think one of the things is, I, uh, <coughs> I thought of when you're talking about, uh, uh, say, if somebody perceived, per, you know, perceived or saw uh, Ajahn Mahabur, when he was really say, yelling at people or being very fierce, uh, you know, one could think, well, he's really angry. Mm. And there's a circumstance that Ajahn Jaya Saro talks about with Ajahn Chah, where he was sitting and underneath Ajahn Chah's kuti and sitting and giving him a foot massage mm. and uh, massaging him. And then this particular monk came in and uh, and Ajahn Chah just let loose this extraordinary torrent of verbal abuse. Mm. Uh, ripped up one side of this monk, down the other, uh, really fierce. And uh, the monk was totally shattered. And he said, Ajahn Chah Sara was sitting there massaging him. Mm. There was no feeling of tension mm. in Ajahn Chah's body. Mm. Completely relaxed. Mm. And then as soon as the... the uh, say the the monk left or you know sat down and calmed down he mm. shifted his attention to somebody else mm. it was as if there was no the, the mood completely changed mm. it was just that was so Ajahn Mahabur probably very very similar yeah, very similar. yeah. <laughs> and he, I mean, he, he could switch back. I mean, he just turn around to somebody and scold them, and then turn around and turn around and nicely this and see somebody else and give them. Very quick, yeah. extremely quick. Yeah. And still is. He doesn't miss anything. I mean, that's the thing that you feel. I'm sure with Ajahn Chah, the same thing. He doesn't miss anything yeah. that's going on around him, even even if. It's about going on behind him or underneath him or above him. <laughs> <laughs> he just doesn't miss it. He doesn't miss it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good question, mm-hmm. you, you mentioned you know, just the importance of having you know, a teacher, and, and also too you mentioned you know, just the Western monks being difficult to train. And, and uh, just in the context of you know, about later in about a year, you know, the, uh, I wonder during your training, like how much admonishment happened between, say, junior members or, you know, trying to get people to understand the rules and, you know, sort of, you know helping people along that way. How much did the junior monks do that versus you just did your own practice, don't worry about what other people are doing, but Ajahn Mahabula do it. I just wonder if you have any recommendations for, for us and how we... I'm not sure I understand the question. But... Um, I mean, here you're living in, 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 in Vantage, you're living in, in a situation where there are maybe six Westerners and 15 or 20 Thais. So the Thais tend to think that they're gonna, they, they could teach us quite a lot because, they, you know, it's their tradition, in a sense. So, you, you know, we, you get a lot of that. It's, it's not quite the same situation that you get here right, with the junior monks. No, so I wasn't quite... Sure, what the question was. Yeah, my question is, what would your recommendation be for, say, myself down, I'm seven pontons, you know, mm-hmm. down to, you know, the newly arrived on the guard, as the puck house, you know, how much should we be admonishing each other, and how much should we just... Well, admonishing implies harsh 
Lang when when we say admonish, you mean jumping on people, right? I mean that's either either that or just even mm -hmm. sort of pointing out what Yeah, I'm pointing out is is certainly valid, right? Pointing out mistakes. But there's a way to do it which is uh, acceptable to everyone, right? I mean you gotta know that and, and everyone's individual, so you gotta kind of look at the guy you're going to admonish and see you've known him for a while, you've lived with him, how much he can take and how much he can't, and where, you know, his points are which you don't want to push, your buttons you don't want to push, and things like that. I mean, you don't want the situation to get out of hand. So you really got to look at the individual and get to know them as much as you can. And that, that again, is just being observant and, and, and all the things I was talking about a minute ago. So they, Whatever you say is going to make him better, is going to be for, for, for his benefit. And not just because I know more than he does, and I'm going to tell him so. And he, he better <laughs> in the future, you know, you'll get another one. So that's probably better to avoid that. Yeah. Do it with a lot of metta. In other words, teaching, teaching requires a lot of metta. In my, in my experience, you've got to have a lot of metta if you want to, to help people. You want to teach people, and, and that has to come from that more than anything else. And if you just teach because you like to teach, and you like and some people just like to browbeat others, and, and that <laughs> it, it just doesn't work. Even uh, I mean, you find that a lot at Bantad or, or among that circle because Luntai is so successful at it. They think, well, I can do it too. That's the way to go, especially if they have a lot of anger and they, they like to struggle. <laughs> <in it. laughs> so they make that mistake and think that they, they can, you know, do what he does. And in, to a certain extent in Thailand, you can get away with it because the Thais are, are they're very respectful of monks, so they don't complain. But you, you can't get away with it with Westerners. Westerners won't accept it at all. So, so it has to come from the right place. And if you have a lot of anger, you have to get, learn to get rid of it. You have to find some. You have to work on that. And that's important, especially if you want to teach people, or talk to people. And you know, most of us do, you know, have a good basis of, of anger. So it takes a long time often to, to get rid of it, and that's not no reason why you shouldn't be, you know, uh, admonishing others. You know, but just keep a keep a you know watch on it, keep a handle on it. Don't let it come from that place. You know, let it come from something good. Santi, it's funny. Um, you know, in your description of when you first arrived, um, if you, uh, how was it sort of in such a kind of ascetic and fierce kind of environment that uh, you were able to sort of really feel um, a sense of confidence and that, that Everything, the teaching and the guidance you were giving was, was coming from that place of metta. Um, especially in the first couple of weeks or something. Must have been a, yeah, it, it, you know, the first couple of weeks is, is, you know, you're just sort of trying to acclimatize yeah. the first couple of weeks. It's, you, you, you don't begin noticing things probably for, for a little bit longer than that. Mm -hmm. Because it's, everything's new and you're talking mostly to the Western monks then. And Lungta is, you know, very removed from the day-to-day -day activities. You don't see him. Oh, there's a lot of time I have Usually he's, he's he, oh yeah, he's always been like that. Yeah. And he's always like being on his own. I mean, before he became a teacher, he was on his own. He didn't want to, you know, even have uh, other monks with him, staying with him. So it was only by the, you know, monks really forcing themselves on him to ask for his teaching and his guidance and eventually came around. So he, he has that character tendency in his character or just to, he's quite happy to be alone. So he, you, you know, you were always reluctant to bother him even about something. Unless it's really necessary. So when, before you became, um, before you had the opportunity to kind of be an attending monk mm -hmm. and help look after him and, and take care of his cootie and roads and stuff like that, mm -hmm. what kind of, aside from these weekly meetings, like you'd see him maybe at alms round and and, uh, and that would really be about it, or sometimes he'd, no, you, he'd kind of yeah. run into him in the monastery? Oh yeah, he would always come down 
in the afternoon and, and sit and have a drink. There was a little shed there where they had monks had theirs. And he would always come and sit there every afternoon. And I would usually sit with Dajan Panya because he would always sit there. All the other monks would run around and hide behind the partition. <laughs> <laughs> so it's better because they were afraid he was going to ask them a question about something, right? And what's going on? Why is this happening? Why is that happening? And no one wanted to answer because they were all afraid if they got the wrong answer, they would get the hammer. So <laughs> they would scatter, literally. And they'd been there years. I mean, they'd been there a long time. I didn't feel, well, you know, why not sit here? And he's probably not going to ask me anything anyway because I can't speak Thai. So. But <laughs> if, if he felt that you, you know, were doing it for the wrong reason, he would. And there, were, there was a Western monk who did sit there and thought, you know, well, I can sit here too. And he must have had the wrong attitude because he was asked to, to, to leave. Well, not the wrong attitude. Right while he was sitting there, you know. Why is he sitting here? You know, and I said, I'm Panya. Where did he come from? Did he come from Lumpulas? Well, Uncle Lai is a good teacher. Tell him to go back there. (laughs) 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 Was there a lot of monks that he kicked out in the early years? A fair amount. He he would threaten more than actually kicking them out. But he he did occasionally, yeah. But it's usually something serious. But he would do more things like he would... One thing he liked to do was ask all of us to chant the Anamurana, the, the blessing, along, especially the Western monks. He would tell, you know, that was one of the things you were told as soon as you got there, you better learn the Yatasapi quick, because he's going to turn to you and just ask you to do it by yourself one day. And you had to know it. If you didn't know it, you were in trouble. But occasionally he did it with the, the Thais, and I remember one, and the, this Thai guy uh, did it, Thai monk, he didn't get the pronunciation right, right? And he, as I said, Mark corrected him two or three times and finally told him to go and get the, the chanting book and bring it down here and sit and read it. And there wasn't one in the library. We all just sit and wait while he ran back to his school to get a chanting book to come down and do the Yatasa thing. <laughs> so you, you know, it could, could be quite embarrassing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> If he had, if Lunta had a sense uh, that people weren't really pushing themselves in their practice, um, again, I think it was in, in an individual manner. If he thought you could push yourself in, in, in a lot harder and you get, weren't just because you didn't care or you were lazy yeah. or whatever, then he might. Get, especially if he thought you, you know, you 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 had the, the right intention. But you just weren't making use of it, you know. Mm-hmm. You just, you know, somehow got lazy. But if he thought you really didn't have much chance of, you know, getting anywhere, then he, he might not. He felt that he was fairly hopeless, and he might not say anything. You know? <laughs> he didn't push everyone, except in a general sense. In the meeting, he would talk about his own practice and say how much he pushed and how valuable that was, and let the individual decide for himself, you know, how much. Because not everyone can practice. For matter of fact, almost no one can practice the way he did. So, the way he describes it. So, you know, you have to adjust the best you can and, and use it as inspiration to, to push yourself to whatever limits you, know, you have, endurance and whatnot. But he, he would never ask you to do more than you, you could do. I mean, he wouldn't, wouldn't ask you to, to go beyond the limit of what you were capable of doing. In those early days, uh, um, did you have did you have a hard time like around the, the meal and uh, what was the kind of time limit you were given? Oh, you don't have any time at all. You still don't have any time at all. You have maybe ten minutes, 15, 10, 10 minutes to eat. I mean, it's it's quick, and you learn to you know. To... <laughs> I still complain about it now at, at one time. So it was always very quick and it was always, I mean, there the, the, the food comes in pots and, he, and it goes to Vungta first and then one monk takes it and goes and gives some into each bowl around. 
And that was done very quickly, and he would be directing them. There's a monk sitting on this side, and the monk sitting down here, and he would, he said, don't just give them to the senior monks first, and then go around, there's nothing left down here. So he would send some down to start this way and come back up, some to start this way, some start in the middle. He was always directing traffic when I was <laughs> where the food was going. And then, then you'd sit down to eat, and he, he ate quickly. And he would say that, you know, you know take your time, <laughs> no way. I mean, he would finish and he'd put his bowl out and he said, you know, everyone just take your time, eat, eat, you know. And it, of course, everyone saw him finish and they quickly finished up. And, uh, and no one wanted to be the last one sitting there, you know, after a while. So, it, you know, and he would say that it happened to him that way when he was a young monk. And he noticed that, and he quickly finished up and, and left, and he didn't want the other, you know, the monks nowadays to have to do what he did back right then, right, and finish up quickly. But the message was, you know, quick. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what he said, you know, you had to finish quickly. So we, we didn't get much time to eat. And that was, I mean, I, I appreciate having the time. Most, most places I, I've stayed. Since, you know, in another present time, you have enough, you have more time to eat. Ajahn, other than the, uh, say, the weekly meetings that he would have in, say, Bindabad, mm. and then maybe in the fortnight in Padimokha, was there much actual communal, you know, coming together as a, as a community? Or was it all, the emphasis was mostly doing practice on one's own? Yeah, I would say more than doing practice on one's own. We didn't meet. What about daily chores? And uh, daily chores we all did together, and you expected that everyone expected to do them and do them quickly and get them over with, and then get back to your practice or get back to your kuti. And there may be special chores, they may have to build a kuti or they may have to do something. And everyone chipped in. I mean, in those days the monks did all the work. Later on, they, they got lay people to come in and do it. And you come together, you do it, you get it over with, and, and get back. So yeah, chores, and that was morning and evening chores. And everybody was expected to go into a lot every day. Unless you're fasting. And fasting was a big deal. Really? Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of fasting, and he, he always emphasized it a lot. In his practice, and he would say how beneficial it had been to him, and suggest that everyone try it. And if you felt it was, it was suitable for you, then, then you know, good. If you felt that it wasn't suited, then you, you, know, you weren't required to do it. But most people, most of the bhikkhus fasted. Some, some a lot more than others. And it's still going on today. And it's still fasting a lot. Did you personally find that practice valuable? For a while. I, f I fasted the first pansa. When I was there, I think I sort of made an early time to fat fast one more day than I ate. So if I ate for two days, I'd fast for three. If I ate for three days, I'd fast for four, something like that, throughout the pansa. And then after that, it was just doing fast for so many days, and sometimes a longer fast, a week or 10 days. I think the longest was 18 days or something like that. But after several years, I began to feel like it was wearing off. It was, first, it seemed very good. But after a while, it seemed that I was just getting into a bit of a rut. I was doing it just because I'd always been doing it since I arrived there, and everyone else was doing it. And I didn't know what else to do. The practice maybe was stalled, and I kept thinking, well, if I keep fasting, it, that something's going to happen. But eventually, he himself, th at that time, there was Ian was there. You probably know Ian. Yes. He's Italian, yeah. He was working with me at the at the, the Kuri, doing the doing the duties and the chores. And as I my boy told him to come and ask me, did I think I was really getting a lot of benefit out of the fasting? And he, he wasn't sure. I think he could sort of the way he put it. I'm not sure if he's, he's getting so much benefit. You know, ask him to look and do it himself and see. So I you know I Figured if he, he wasn't sure, then, then I couldn't, certainly couldn't be sure. So I just gave up fasting. All day. <laughs> <laughs> I just stopped fasting. And then I never did, took it up again. Right. So it seems that 
And, and I think this is one when I visited with Ajahn Sumedho, well maybe because of his busy monk was different, but it seems everything kind of came through Ajahn Anya that you didn't have direct questioning or a dialogue with him, is that correct? Uh, well, yeah, for the most part, except if you were working with Eddie Scuddy all the time and you were there in the morning before Pindapati, you were there after the meal, you were there in the afternoon. I used to go four times a day, usually. And then there, there were, he was relaxed, usually, sitting, and, and there, was, uh, there was more opportunity then. Mm-hmm. Also, he would go and to see Ajahn Panya at his Kuriya quite often. He'd just walk up and sit down and have a chat. So he, he, was, he had more you know, opportunity to talk to him. Right. But for me, I'm, I'm fairly lucky that I was, was able to go over there so often, you know, every day. But you no, know, for most of the Western monks, it wasn't so easy. They didn't have the line. There's very few of them had at the time that it could handle it. Is that voluntary, or was, was one invited to do that? Or to no, as, as I say, he just picked me out one one day and told me to go. You mean working? Yeah, it was good. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he would just, actually choose people. He would actually choose people. Right. And that went on for quite a long time. I think eventually one monk asked. I got up the courage to ask him if there was a vacancy and, and ask him if he could do it. But n- normally, he would just choose someone. That's how. And so you were his tenant for many years in a row? Or? Yeah, 17, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and he liked to keep the same person. Yeah. If he trusted you, then he liked to keep that. that and he didn't like to change. It wasn't like as a Monday would always shift and change right, yeah. and, and there'd always be somebody new. And it was part of the way he trained the, all the monks, but Ajahn Mahabodh did, didn't like that. And he, did, he was a very private kind of person, so he didn't like having uh, other you know, new monks around doing these duties who didn't know. And then he would have to spend a lot of time instructing them again. And once I got it down and I understood you know, what was needed, then he could just let me go and do it, and he, he didn't have to worry about it. And he had a lot of other things on his mind, you know, a lot of other responsibilities. So, with that sense of familiarity, did your sense of fear, um, of his kind of fierceness, yeah. sort of diminish? Over time, yeah. yeah. And, and, I mean, he also appreciated the fact that I've been working there for a long time and trying really hard. So, he, I mean, he, he eased off, you might say, on his own. Because, I mean, we just had an understanding that developed over time. So he wasn't always, unless he really thought that I was, you know, again, had some defilements that he wanted to get at. And then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that happens from time to time. You know. Thanks, but I mean, so many subtle things that when you're with someone like him that long, he doesn't have to scold you to, for you to know that he's not pleased with. It's just little subtle things, so it changes, and that's what he liked. And he liked to be able to teach on a subtle level rather than to have to go through it. And he didn't like to explain things. He, he wanted you to pick it up on your own. And if, he, if you didn't, then that was a burden on him, in a sense. I mean, he liked somebody who could, could figure out what he wanted and then do it. And then all of, and he could just sort of give subtle suggestions. How to, how to, I mean, he would use that then as a way of teaching you, in a sense. Okay, let's, let's go to another level of subtlety and see how you do with that. And then keep going like that. I uh, at Bhanta, is it common for monks to like, go off on Tudong, or is that uncommon? No, it's quite common. Very common. Tudong in the sense of going, leaving the monastery and going... Uh, most likely to another monastery, quieter, rather than just walking out the gate and, and walking down the road. It's not so easy to wander around Thailand like they did in the old days with all the forest has been cut down. So if you, if you like walking down the highway, you <laughs> can call that Tudong, okay, and you see some monks doing that. Or just across bare fields, you know, rice fields. So it's not... Not the same environment. So if you want to do that, you might go up to the north Chiang Mai area where there's still a fair amount of forest and hill, hill tribes. You can walk there. Yeah. 
or go. I, mean, I, I went and stayed in the national park for a while, and there's, there's no settlements in the national park, no houses or anything. You can come out, walk out, and get food, and go back and stay. In. But that wasn't constantly moving, I was living in one location. So I'm wondering. And did Lung Dang himself ever, at, at some point, just decide to go leave for periods of time? Or did he always stay at Long Dang? Well, it was always his base, yeah. But he, he, he didn't just wander off and on, on his own. But he, he, he regularly went to, to Bangkok. That's the one place he would always go two or three times a year, beginning in 1980, what, I don't know, 87? No, before that, probably 85. And he would t just go there to teach the people there who wanted to see him and didn't have an opportunity to go all the way down. But no, he, he, he didn't leave very often except to do that. <coughs> When he taught us in the language that he is, did he speak uh, in uh, prim Lao? primarily? No, primarily Thai, Central Thai. But he he would give a talk, which might last anywhere from forty-five minutes to an hour, or an hour and ten minutes, and then he would stop. And that was a sort of formal talk, and that was always in Thai. Then he would sit, ask Ajahn Panya to to explain what he just said to the. Runs, right, the Westerners. And I think Panya would turn around and talk for five or ten minutes, but he doesn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then there would be an informal talk. Then, then Ajahn Mahabha would just sit back and start telling stories or talking. I mean, he could talk about anything, but it, often it would, would be loud then. And he always break out into stories about his childhood and things that happened when he was with his uncle or the hunters or you know wild animals or anything. <coughs> and then that might go on for another hour or so. And he never, he usually didn't ask that to be translated into, into English. So that was sort of went on to the end of the talk. But he, you know, he he would he would talk in Lao, but only to certain audience. You know, with the bhikkhus, yeah, most of the bhikkhus were Lao anyway, right? Isan bhikkhus. And with the villages, obviously. Right? Speaking Isan. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In your practice as being uh, Umdaz Uputak, um, other than kind of how you were talking about needing to be inventive and kind of on top of things, because things were always done in a, a different way. Mm -hmm. um, how, how did you find that that helped you? In 17 years, it's a long time, as opposed to, you know, maybe other monks who weren't attending to him and they were doing, as you said, practicing on their own a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just wondering how that benefited your practice in particular with, with doing it for so long and so well. Yeah, mm. yeah it's, it's difficult to pinpoint. You know, this thing, I mean, you, again, you start thinking like, he thinks you pick up he, he, from him the way he understands things, the way he does things. It sort of sinks in and becomes part of you, so that you know you're always carrying him around with you wherever you go, and it, it becomes so ingrained that you, it never leaves you. So even after you've left and gone somewhere else, it's it's always there. You know what he would do in a certain situation. So if you keep applying that to your meditation practice, you know the right way to go when you get to a crossroads or when you get to a problem or something like that. You can reflect back on that, and so it's there with you. In other words, you don't you don't have to go to the teacher and start asking questions of him. You know, you can you can ask the questions inside and get the answers. I mean, I think that's the main thing, the really valuable part. But there are a lot of other things that you learn from, from him, you know, about self-sacrifice and things like that. And a lot of it is that, because it's, it's, it's not as convenient to do practice when you, you know, working like that, you've got all these responsibilities, he goes to Bangkok and you go with him and then you get involved in a lot of things that, you know, go, that sort of break up 
the calm and break up the practice. So you have to also sacrifice a lot of that too. But that's good. I mean, that, that's a positive thing. But it sometimes hurts. Sometimes you feel, you know, I'd really like to get off on my own now and then do some practice. And you have to put that aside. You have to put your ego aside and say, just do it because it's the right thing to do. And that's important. So when we were talking earlier today about um, like speech, and you had described uh, it in particular how often in, in work situations, just even if one person starts to, to kind of uh, talk of it, and then it can kind of spread around this, like kind of rapidly, even if other people are trying to practice. And I was just wondering uh, how Long Da kind of handled his monastery in that way around speech and expectations around the monks and how he would deal with Hmm. I mean, that, he would expect everyone to, you know, focus on what they're doing and stop talking. But that didn't, you know, he wasn't always there overseeing the work. And and, and boys will be boys, yeah. They you stop talking, and then <laughs> so it, it means it, it's tough. I mean, it, there's the the way he teaches, and then there's the practice. And then, you know, as I say, it only takes one monk who's really sociable, and, and everyone gets involved in, in talking and working at the same time. So, unless everyone's on that same page, right, and decides, okay, we're just going to work here. We're not going to talk. It's difficult. But somehow you've got to, you know, again, be patient and, and you know, put aside that irritation, you know, that you might feel and, and just go with, go with the flow in a sense, right? And don't get stressed by it. And you said, you know, that's the situation is now. Okay, I'm going to do the best I can and, and not, you know, make a problem out of it. Don't make a problem out of it, right? Otherwise, you start thinking about it too much and then it becomes a much bigger problem than it was. And I mean, you can tune out if you want. And it's just that you often feel you have to be one of the gang and, and talk, and you feel uncomfortable if you're not. And so it sort of makes it difficult, but if you, you know, realize what the, the situation is and the, the nature of, you know, of your problem, and just don't make a problem out of it. Right? Don't make, make too much out of it. And when you get back, you get back to practice. I mean, it, we all go through this all the time. We go through life like this all the time. There's always distractions. And one of the you know, <clears throat> things we have to do is learn how to deal with them in this life, whether in this life or whatever yeah. kind of life we're in. And that's, in a sense, it's, it's a valuable part of the practice because you've got to learn it. You, you can't just sit by yourself 24 hours a day. You know, and you couldn't do it. Even even if you had that opportunity, you would you know you you drive you nuts, right? So, <laughs> so you have to be thankful for, for you know the community and the certain sacrifices you have to make when you're living in the community. So I guess our prison systems are not creating enlightened beings, but a lot of nutty people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it looks like it's wound down. You want to offer it? And my Anuvadakata Sadukaran Gadama Thank you very much. I just really appreciate your time. <laughs>